And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Accenture fourth quarter fiscal 2021 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in listen only mode. Later, we will conduct, conduct a question and answer session. If you wish to ask a question, please press one then zero on your telephone's keypad. To remove yourself from queue, please repeat the one then zero command. If you should require assistance during the call, please press star then zero. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to our host, Angie Park, Managing Director and Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator, and thanks everyone for joining us today on our fourth quarter and full fiscal 2021 earnings announcement. As the Operator just mentioned, I'm Angie Park, Managing Director, Head of Investor Relations. On today's call, you will hear from Julie Sweet, our Chair and Chief Executive Officer, and Casey McClure, our Chief Financial Officer. We hope you've had an opportunity to review the news release we issued a short time ago. Let me quickly outline the agenda for today's call. Julie will begin with an overview of our results. KC will take you through the financial details, including the income statement and balance sheet, along with some key operational metrics for both the fourth quarter and full fiscal year. Julie will then provide a brief update on our market positioning before KC provides our business outlook for the first quarter and full fiscal year 2022. We will then take your questions before Julie provides a wrap-up at the end of the call. Some of the matters we'll discuss on this call, including our business outlook, are forward-looking, and as such are subject to known and unknown risks and uncertainties, including but not limited to those factors set forth in today's news release and discussed in our annual report on Form 10-K and quarterly reports on Form 10-Q and other SEC filings. These risks and uncertainties could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed in this call. During our call today, we will reference certain non-GAAP financial measures which we believe provide useful information for investors. We include reconciliations of non-GAAP financial measures where appropriate to GAAP in our news release or in the investor relations section of our website at Accenture.com. As always, Accenture assumes no obligation to update the information presented on this conference call. Now, let me turn the call over to Julie. Thank you, Angie, and everyone for joining us. Before diving into our results, thank you to our 624,000 incredibly talented people around the world, including over 8,500 managing directors. This past fiscal year, your hard work and dedication to creating value that matters for our clients was unwavering despite the ongoing and sometimes quite extreme challenges of COVID. We've had a truly extraordinary year, as reflected in our outstanding financial results and in the 360-degree value we delivered beyond our financials. From the over 120,000 promotions and over 31 million training hours, an increase of 43% for our people, to increasing our workforce by approximately 118,000 people, creating significant employment opportunities in our communities, to achieving 46% women on our way to our goal of gender parity by 2025, to our top three ranking in the Refinitiv Global Diversity and Inclusion Index for the fourth consecutive year, to the number one position with our largest ecosystem partners, to the exciting accomplishment of 50% renewable energy now powering our offices and centers globally, to the donation of $54 million in COVID surge relief. In December, we will publish our first ever annual 360 degree value report to more fully describe the FY21 value we created in all directions, and we'll report against three additional key ESG frameworks, SASB, TCFD, and WEF IBC. We believe that the trust we have from our clients and partners, our continuous innovation, and our ability to consistently attract the best people, including the 56,000 net new hires this past quarter, are directly linked to our commitment to measuring our success by how well we create this 360-degree value for all our stakeholders clients, people, partners, shareholders, and communities, and on our culture of shared success. 
Here are some key financial highlights of the year which position us strongly as we begin FY22. FY21 demonstrated our leadership in helping our clients achieve compressed transformation. With 72 clients with bookings greater than $100 million, compared to 53 last year, and 229 diamond clients, our largest client relationship, compared to 216 last year. <coughs> with a 20% increase in bookings to $59 billion, we have strong momentum across all dimensions of our business, across geographic markets, industries, and services. Reaching revenues of $50.5 billion, a significant milestone, representing 11% growth, we added $6.2 billion in revenue this year, gaining significant market share with 40 basis points of operating margin expansion, demonstrating yet again our ability to grow profitably and at scale. We achieved this profitable growth while investing at a higher level than ever before, with $4.2 billion in acquisitions, $1.1 billion in R&D in assets, platforms, and industry solutions, including growing our portfolio of patents and pending patents to more than 8,200, and total training investment of $900 million. And according to Brand Z, our brand value increased 56% to over $64 billion, ranking us number 27 on the prestigious Brand Z's Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands list. Finally, I want to highlight cloud and our ability to move with agility to serve our clients' needs and capture momentum in the market. At the beginning of FY21, after investing in cloud for a decade, we saw that the pandemic would dramatically accelerate our clients' move to the cloud. More than technology, the move to the cloud would be about the adoption of a new operating system for the future enterprise, a dynamic continuum of capabilities from public to edge to everything in between, opening up radically new ways for companies to work, compete, and drive value. Just over one year ago, we created Accenture Cloud First to capitalize on this momentum bringing together all of our capabilities from migration to cloud native development, data, AI, industry, talent, and change. Accenture Cloud First was the biggest driver of our overall cloud business growth from $12 billion to $18 billion, a 44% increase. Casey, over to you. Thank you, Julie, and thanks to all of you for joining us on today's call. We were very pleased with our results in the fourth quarter which completes an outstanding year for Accenture and reflect broad-based momentum across all dimensions of our business. Once again, our results reflect our relentless focus to deliver across our three key imperatives for driving superior stakeholder value. So let me begin by summarizing a few of the highlights of the quarter. Revenue growth of 21% in local currency at the top end of our guided range reflects double-digit growth across all markets, all industry groups, and all services. We also continue to extend our leadership position at an accelerated pace, with growth significantly above the market. Operating margin was 14.6%, an increase of 30 basis points for the quarter, reflecting in 40 basis points of expansion for the full year. We delivered this expansion while investing significantly in our business and in our people to position us for long-term market leadership. We delivered very strong EPS of $2.20, which represents 29% growth compared to adjusted EPS last year. And finally, we delivered free cash flow of $2.2 billion, which was driven by continued strong growth and profitability. Now let me turn to some of the details. New bookings were $15 billion for the quarter, with a book to bill of $1.1. Consulting bookings were $8 billion, with a book to bill of $1.1. Outsourcing bookings were $7.1 billion, with a book to bill of $1.2. We were very pleased with our new bookings, which represent 7% growth in U.S. dollars, with 18 clients with bookings over $100 million. We were also pleased with the strength of bookings across all services, with a book-to-bill of one in strategy and consulting, 
1.2 in technology services, and 1.1 in operations. Turning now to revenues. Revenues for the quarter were $13.4 billion, a 24% increase in U.S. dollars and 21% in local currency, slightly above our FX adjusted range, as the FX tailwind was 3% compared to the 4% estimated last quarter. Consulting revenues for the quarter were $7.3 billion, up 29% in U.S. dollars and 25% in local currency. Outsourcing revenues were $6.1 billion, up 19% in U.S. dollars and 16% in local currency. Taking a closer look at our service dimensions, strategy and consulting, technology services, and operations all grew very strong double digits. Turning to our geographic markets, in North America, revenue growth was 22% in local currency, driven by double-digit growth in consumer goods, retail and travel services, software and platforms, and public service. In Europe, revenues grew 18% in local currency, led by double-digit growth in consumer goods, retail, and travel services, industrial, and banking and capital markets. Looking closer at the countries, Europe was driven by double-digit growth in the UK, Germany, France, and Italy. In growth markets, we delivered 21% revenue growth in local currency, driven by double-digit growth in consumer goods, retail, and travel services, banking and capital markets, and high-tech. From a country perspective, growth markets was led by double-digit growth in Japan, Australia, and Brazil. Moving down the income statement, gross margin for the quarter was 33.3%, compared with 31.8% for the same period last year. Sales and marketing expense for the quarter was 11.3%, compared with 10.6% for the fourth quarter last year. General administrative expense was 7.4%, compared to 6.8% for the same quarter last year. Operating income was $2 billion in the fourth quarter, reflecting a 14.6 operating margin, up 30 basis points compared with Q4 last year. As a reminder, in Q4 last year, we recorded an investment gain that impacted our tax rate and increased EPS by $0.29 cents for the quarter. The following comparisons exclude this impact and reflect adjusted results. Our effective tax rate for the quarter was 25%, compared with an adjusted effective tax rate of 28.4% for the fourth quarter last year. Diluted earnings per share were $2.20 compared with adjusted EPS of $1.70 in the fourth quarter last year. Day service outstanding were 38 days compared to 36 days last quarter and 35 days in the fourth quarter of last year. Free cash flow for the quarter was $2.2 billion, resulting from cash generated by operating activities of $2.4 billion, net of property and equipment additions of $236 million. Our cash balance at August 31st was $8.2 billion, compared with $8.4 billion at August 31st last year. With regards to our ongoing objective to return cash to shareholders, in the fourth quarter, we repurchased or redeemed 3 million shares for $915 million at an average price of $305.61 per share. Also in August, we paid our fourth quarterly cash dividend of $0.88 cents per share for a total of $558 million. And our board of directors declared a quarterly cash dividend of $0.97 cents per share to be paid on November 15th, a 10% increase over last year, and approved $3 billion of additional share repurchase authority. Now, I would like to take a moment to summarize our outstanding year. We are extremely pleased with the performance of our business in fiscal year 21, greatly exceeding all aspects of our original outlook that we provided last September. We delivered $59 billion in new bookings, a 20% increase in U.S. dollars over last year, which positions us well as we begin fiscal year 22. Revenues increased a record $6.2 billion dollars hitting the $50 billion mark, reflecting growth of 11% in local currency for the full year. This result 
which is more than double the revenue growth we anticipated at the beginning of the year, showcases our agility and ability to quickly scale to deliver value and outcomes for our clients. Operating margin of 15.1% reflected a 40 basis point expansion over fiscal year 20, above the top end of our original guided range, even after making continued significant investments in our business and our people. Adjusted earnings per share were $8.80, reflecting 18% growth over adjusted FY20 EPS and was well above our revenue growth. As a reminder, we adjusted earnings in both years to exclude gains on an investment. Free cash flow of $8.4 billion was significantly above our original guided range, reflecting a free cash flow to net income ratio of 1.5, driven by strong profitability. And finally, we significantly exceeded our original guidance for capital allocation by returning $5.9 billion of cash to shareholders while investing roughly $4.2 billion across 46 acquisitions to acquire critical skills and capabilities in strategic, high-growth areas of the market. So again, FY21 was truly an outstanding year. Momentum continues into fiscal 22, and we are laser-focused on capturing the market opportunities, coupled with a disciplined execution that you and we expect of us. Now let me turn it back to Julie. Thanks, Casey. Turning to the demand environment, compressed transformation underpinned by cloud and digital continues to drive strong double-digit growth across our business, including for applied intelligence, cloud, Industry X, intelligent operations, interactive, intelligent platform services, security, and transformational change management. Technology is the single biggest driver of change in companies today, and the depth, breadth, and scale of our technology capabilities across our services is unmatched. We see the demand environment shaping up for FY22 to be more of the same. While digital leaders seeking to, seeking to widen their competitive advantage and companies seeking to leapfrog their cloud and digital transformation are driving momentum in our business. The vast majority of companies are early in their transformation. And whether digital leader, leapfrogger, laggard, or in between, all face multi-year journeys ahead of them. Because the replatforming in the cloud and use of new technologies across the enterprise is a once in a digital era prof profound transformation. Simultaneously, we have ongoing exponential technology change that is accelerating and will create new opportunities, disruptions, and change for our clients. In addition, growth in parts of our business are by their very nature continuously evolving. For example, Interactive, now a $12.5 billion business growing 15%, continues to set a new standard for customer experience, connection, sales, and marketing, at the intersection of data, creativity, and technology, and is tied to the ever-changing needs and preferences of B2C and B2B customers. Similarly, security, now a $4.4 billion business growing 29%, is driven by needs related to an ever-expanding digital threat landscape, and with our managed services, is providing much-needed protection and talent to our clients. Our clients value the depth and breadth of our services for the entire enterprise across strategy and consulting, interactive technology and operations, and industry and functional expertise across 13 industries, plus the ability to deliver tangible outcomes as well as our strong track record of investing ahead of our clients to anticipate their needs, needs and drive our next ways of growth such as our early moves in digital, cloud, and security. There remain entire parts of the enterprise for which digitization and the move to the cloud has only just begun. In particular, both the things companies make and the way they make things are being dramatically changed by technology, and that is the focus of our Industry X business, which we believe is the next big digital frontier. 
In fact, a 2021 Gartner survey of board of directors indicates that 93% expect that the number one business priority that will see transformational improvement from digital technology is manufacturing, distribution, and supply chain. We have invested for nearly a decade in Industry X and are now at approximately $5 billion in revenue, growing 36%. We look forward to welcoming the 4,200 industry-leading engineers and consultants of Umlaut when the acquisition closes in October. Similarly, sustainability is a critical area for which technology is still evolving. We believe that every business must be a sustainable business, and yet companies are at very early stages of figuring out how to make this shift. Last year, building on years of investment and experience, we launched our sustainability services under our new Chief Responsibility Officer and Global Sustainability Services Lead. We have continued to accelerate our focus in this expanding and changing market and are proud of the work we are doing with leading partners like MasterCard as we enhance its ability to track and analyze the carbon emissions of their suppliers and help decarbonize the UK energy system with clients such as National Grid. We do see a shift in the nature of the demand for our managed services across IT, security, and operations, with these services emerging as one of our most strategic differentiators. As companies simultaneously seek greater resilience, face a war for talent, the need to rapidly digitize and cost pressures, strategic managed services are increasingly a C-suite priority. With Accenture as a trusted partner of choice and increasingly integrated as a part of their talent strategy. Table stakes for managed services are efficiency, resiliency, and reliability. We further differentiate in our managed services because they are uniquely informed by our strong strategy and consulting capabilities and deep industry and functional expertise. And they benefit from our strong level of investment for digital platforms like Synopse and MyWizard and the seamless integration with our ecosystem partners, as well as due to the incredible pool of talented people our clients can access quickly when partnering with us. For example, we are partnering with Olympus, a leading manufacturer of optical and digital precision technology to help them drive their transformation to become a global medical technology company. As part of this partnership, we have acquired their Japanese IT subsidiary company, which we will transform to deliver significant IT cost savings to Olympus, as well as upskill their people, combining their knowledge with our talent and technology to lead Olympus's digital transformation. Now let me bring to life some more the demand we are seeing. All of these examples bring together the diverse capabilities across Accenture to create tangible value. We are a leader in cloud because we're able to serve our clients across the cloud continuum and create business value. We are partnering with Kubota, a Japanese multinational company providing solutions leveraging a diverse range of products, technologies, and services in the fields of food, water, and the environment to accelerate Kubota's digital transformation by creating solutions that will enhance the productivity and safety of food, promote circularity of water resources and waste, and improve urban and living in, uh, environments. We will help create innovative sustainability solutions and a platform applying leading edge digital technologies, including AI and IoT. Diverse data held across the group will be centralized for easy maintenance and use. We're also modernizing, replacing, or migrating legacy applications to the cloud and strengthening their global computer uh, security incident response team. We are partnering with Jabil, a U.S.-based global manufacturing services company, to further enhance their IT infrastructure capabilities through providing infrastructure managed services for digital workplace, network, cloud, and data center support. We're helping Fenya, a Finnish insurer offering casualty, motor, and health and accident services to implement a cloud-based policy administration system to improve customer service using data and automation to make sales, claims, payments, and policy management processes more user-friendly. This will allow the company to quickly respond to changing market and customer demands and meet its goal of providing the best customer experience in the industry. Compressed transformation is occurring across industries. 
We're partnering with Unilever, one of the world's largest consumer goods companies, in their digital transformation. Together, we are setting a new industry standard by reinventing technology delivery with cutting-edge automation, delivering cloud migration at scale, the largest ERP migration to the cloud in the industry, and shifting to technology solutions that support their growth strategy. With McCormick, a global leader in flavor in the food industry, where we are partnering on a strategic transformation program encompassing finance, supply chain, logistics, and plant maintenance. The new cloud-based platform and innovative data-driven approach will help standardize processes, increase efficiencies, and support their goal of doubling in size quickly. We're helping a European financial institution build the bank of the future and helping them become a next-level innovator, one that is leveraging technology and sustainability to transform multiple parts of their business, drive hyper-personalized customer experience, and create new lines of business like wealth management and insurance, which is expected to triple digital sales by 2023 and improve their already stellar cost-to-income ratio. At the same time, we're helping them deliver on their ESG initiatives, including inclusive financing, green software, and carbon data-free data centers. At Accenture, we're enabling new experience in growth and cost transformation across the enterprise and across industries. And a key enabler to these innovative scaled service is the power of our operations capabilities. We are helping Open Fiber, an Italian telecommunications company, design and orchestrate construction of an ultra broadband network, which will deliver fiber to 20 million households across Italy. Digitization and automation will help the construction site to proceed faster and more efficiently. With Interactive, we're helping media mark Saturn Retail Group, Europe's leading consumer electronics retail, retailer, transform their digital content capabilities with a state-of-the-art marketing operation. Automation and data insights enabled by Synops will help deliver more engaging and personalized content while driving millions in savings. Our industry expertise continues to be a core competitive advantage, allowing us to bring deep industry and cross-industry knowledge enterprise-wide for our clients. I want to recognize, in particular, our software and platform industry, which is approximately $4 billion in revenue. In Q4, this group celebrated 20 consecutive quarters of double-digit growth, serving as a leading partner to our clients in this hyper-growth industry. Casey, back to you. Thanks, Julie. Now let me turn to our business outlook. For the first quarter of fiscal 22, we expect revenues to be in the range of 13.9 to 14.35 billion. This assumes the impact of FX will be about positive 0.5% compared to the first quarter of fiscal 21 and reflects an estimated 18 to 22% growth of local currencies. For the full fiscal year 22, Based upon how the rates have been trending over the last few weeks, we currently assume the impact of FX on our results in U.S. dollars will be approximately negative 0.5% compared to fiscal 21. For the full fiscal 22, we expect our revenue to be in the range of 12 to 15% growth in local currency over fiscal 21, which includes an inorganic contribution of about 5%, as we continue to expect to invest about $4 billion in acquisitions. For operating margin, we expect fiscal year 22 to be 15.2 to 15.4%, a 10 to 30 basis point expansion over fiscal 21 results. We expect our annual effective tax rate to be in the range of 23 to 25%. This compares to an adjusted effective tax rate of 23.1% in fiscal 21. For earnings per share, we expect full-year diluted EPS for fiscal 22 to be in the range of $9.90 to $10.18, or 13 to 16% growth over adjusted fiscal 21 results. For the full fiscal 22, we expect operating cash flow to be in the range of $8.2 to $8.7 billion, property and equipment additions to be approximately $700 million, and free cash flow to be in the range of $7.5 to $8 billion. Our free cash flow guidance reflects a very strong free cash flow to net income ratio of 1.1 to 1.2. Finally, we expect to return at least $6.3 billion through dividends and share repurchases as we remain committed to returning a substantial portion of cash to our shareholders. With that, let's open it up so that we can take your questions. Angie? 
Thanks, Casey. I would ask that you each keep to one question and a follow-up to allow as many participants as possible to ask a question. Operator, would you please provide instructions for those on the call? Of course. And once again, if you wish to ask a question, please press 1, then 0 on your telephone keypad. You may withdraw your question at any time by repeating the 1, then 0 command. And today, let's see, our first question comes from the line of Keith Bachman of Bank of Montreal. Please go ahead. Hi, many thanks for letting me the opportunity to ask a question. I had two, if I could. Uh, outstanding set of results and guidance, first of all. Um, I wanted to ask about the cash flow, if I could, um, guidance. And um, even at the high end of the range, um, the cash flow margin would be a pretty significant step down from 20, fiscal 20 into fiscal 21. So I just wondered, um, is there any puts and takes within the cash flow guidance that we should be aware of uh, as we're doing our model? Thank you. And I have a quick follow-up to that. Sure. Great. Thanks. Nice to hear from you, Keith. Um, yes, yeah, so our free cash flow is $7.5 to $8 billion. It reflects very strong free cash flow to net income ratio of 1.1 to 1.2. And so we're really pleased with that. Um, and it does have slightly higher CapEx expense of $700 million. Um, so that's one slight difference from over, over 21. Um, we did have exceptionally strong free cash flow in fiscal year 21 at 1.5 free cash, you know, free cash flow to net income ratio, and that you know is just exceptional performance. Um, it's not unusual for us to have um, free cash flow guidance at, uh, at the beginning of the year. That is a decrease over what we've done in the previous years. Uh, and then lastly, we do allow um, for a slight uptick uh, in uh, DSO. Uh, in our guidance for next year, which would still be, you know, uh, very industry-leading uh, DSO performance. Okay, excellent, excellent. And then, Julie, may just for you, um, I think you mentioned this year you did um, 46 M&A deals, and you mentioned in the guidance comments that uh, there's qu quite a bit of M&A, uh, I think $4 billion in M&A contemplated for this coming fiscal year. H how do you think about the integration risk? It Accenture has... Um, I would argue a very special culture, and you're bringing in a lot of new people over the course of the last 12 months and the forward next 12 months. H how do you think about the risk of a simulation uh, of these deals, and h how do you manage this process? You have a very good track record over the last 10 years, but th there is a lot of M&A on the table that you're bringing in the company. I'm just wondering if you could speak to uh, how you think about the risk associated with that uh, to make sure the business keeps uh, keeps moving forward. Sure. Um, so, uh, great question, and thanks, Keith. So, first of all, um, as you indicated, we've got a really strong track record, and so this step up in acquisitions comes based on years of experience, including in fine-tuning integration. Uh, so, that's number one. Secondly, our acquisitions happen globally, and, they're, um, and in, as I've talked about this year, they're pretty evenly balanced. And why is that important? Um, when we switched to our model earlier this year of a geographic-focused model uh, uh, from a P&L perspective, one of the reasons is to allow us as well to be super close to our people. And most of these acquisitions are not global, right? Uh, some are, like an umlaut, you know, but like, for example, Project Novetta, uh, Novetta in the federal business, you know, very local. And, and the vast majority are, you know, in one or two markets. Like they're, and so the integration, it's not like you have this enormous company that's trying to integrate lots of people all over the um, globe at the same time. We have senior leaders accountable for the acquisitions. And so we really get the right balance. And we have our own, you know, and, and so, for example, when we look at this, we look at market by market, how many acquisitions are we doing in this market? So how does that enable us to make sure that we can spend the time? So this is a finely tuned approach um, for integration. And of course, we bring on people in acquisition or not all the time. And so right. this focus on culture is just part of who we are. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Julie. And our next question comes from the line of Lisa Ellis with Moffitt Nathanson. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, thinking about the $50 billion revenue milestone, which is pretty amazing. Um, Julie, as you're 
mapping out the path to 60 billion over the next few <laughs> years. Can you talk about where you see the major sources of incremental revenue um, looking out from here forward? Thank you. Great. Um, well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Nice to talk to you. So, first of all, um, uh, and I talked a little bit about it, this in the script, we are still very early in the transformation of, uh, of companies in building just their digital core. So, for example, if you look at something like SAP, you know, their stats that they point out, you sort of have less than 20% of companies who've actually both bought and begun implementing s hana Right, and we see the um, the move to the cloud. You've got sort of maybe today roughly 25 to 30 percent of workloads. So there's a lot of work, which is a multi-year journey, in actually building the digital core, and then at the same time transforming the ways they work. And there, so we've got multi-year ahead. And even when you look at who's doing compressed transformation, you have this you know, core of leaders and leapfroggers, but the vast majority of companies are not yet engaged in compressed transformation. So just from a multi-year outlook on the fundamentals of replatforming and moving to a true digital, tech, um, digital enabled uh, enterprises, still in early stages. Then you add on top of that, there are whole parts of the enterprise where even the technologies um, are really new. And so Industry X is a great example of that. We see that as the next uh, digital frontier, and we're still very, very early. Uh, and so that will be, you know, kind of its own wave uh, as, we look, as we look forward. And then areas like sustainability. Again, technology is early. Every industry has to find its way on, on sustainability. And so as we, um, you know, think about our own growth strategy. It starts with what our clients need. So we continue to diversify the parts of the enterprise that we're serving, uh, and that enables, uh, that's what our clients need, and that enables next ways of growth for us. And we continue to innovate and anticipate, like in sustainability, what our clients uh, need. Uh, and so when you kind of take this, you see both from serving the enterprise, the maturity of, uh, of that, and then you add on top of that that there are areas that are evergreen, like interactive. It's all about client. It's a growth agenda. It's always going to change. Manufacturing will be the same. Security grows as the digital landscape grows. So hopefully it gives you a flavor of how we're thinking about both our next waves of growth and just the resiliency of the diversity of what we do. Mm -hmm. Yep, terrific. Um, the, my follow-up was actually on managed services, which you called out in the prepared remarks. Not really used to thinking about Accenture doing managed services. Can you just elaborate a, a bit on that? It, it, is this primarily actually infrastructure-related managed services or apps or just maybe a little bit more detail on what exactly you're doing and, and Accenture's differentiation there? Thanks. So just think of we have consulting and outsourcing, right? So. Um, so managed services is just another term for outsourcing. Uh, and so if you think about our operations uh, business, which is now about um, $8 billion, right? So all the uh, managed services we provide are everything from finance and accounting to industry specific, like we called out in the script, the stuff we're doing in telecom, we're doing things um, you know, in insurance and uh, both um, uh, health and you know PNC. So we got industry specific. We have marketing services. So there's that. Then of course there's our powerful IT services. We've been doing outsourcing for years, right? Uh, term application outsourcing is mm -hmm. an industry term. Uh, and then we have our managed services and security. We bought Symantec last year. Uh, and so this is a core part when you think about our revenue. You know between consulting and outsourcing. And uh, the, the point that's happening now is that we've always done this, but what we're seeing is, you know, I just had a, a call with a, a CEO the other day who's like, he started a call with like, Julie, I'm really having a hard time hiring people in digital, right? And, and how are you seeing companies, you know, help? And we talked about how by strategically outsourcing, like in security, in marketing, you can access the digital talent and it becomes part of their own talent strategy to address the war for talent while at the same time digitizing faster 
you know, I have another client who said, look, you know, you, you had 50 things that my IT department was about to build in order for us to automate and transform. And I get it through your Synops platform. The same is true on the IT and infrastructure side. Um, uh, and of course, you know, infrastructure managed services in the cloud growing area um, uh, as well from the move to the cloud. So I think that the, the shift we were calling out, Lisa, though, is just how strategic this is at a time of compressed transformation because it's meeting the needs of the war on talent and the need to digitize and the need to move fast um, uh, at the same time. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot and congrats. Thanks. And our next question comes from the line of Brian Bergen with Cowan. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Um, first, I have a question on bookings. Can you talk about the dynamic in 4Q? It looks like outsourcing did tick down for the first time in a while year over year. So just anything to call up there. And then just generally, how do you see the pipeline developing as you think about fiscal 22 bookings levels? Yeah, thanks, Brian. So, um, you know, there's nothing really to point out in terms of uh, Q4 bookings with outsourcing. They can just be a little bit lumpy. Uh, but it was very strong performance. But uh, let me just maybe talk a little bit about overall bookings um, as we head into uh, 22. You know, we do feel really good about the momentum in our business. And as Julie went through, we had, you know, 72 clients with bookings over 100 million this year. Um, and you can see that then helping us as we head into FY22, Brian, with the 18 to 22 percent that we have in, the, in, in Q1. And you also see that in our 12 to 15 percent uh, revenue range that we have for fiscal 22. I think it's important to, to also note that you know it does include about five percent in organic contribution, but at the you know um, at the top end of our of our red revenue range, again driven by driven by bookings, it's going to represent about 10 percent organic growth at the upper end. And while we do benefit from an easier compare in the first half it does continue to imply strong organic growth in the second half. And if you look at why is that, when you peel back bookings, again, please with the $15 billion that we had in Q4, strong book to build 1.1, it is $60 billion for the whole year with double-digit growth in consulting. And I think it's important to also note in consulting bookings, we had $8 billion for the last three quarters, which is terrific. And outsourcing, which for the entire year had a very strong book to build, 1.2 in all three markets and services. And when you peel it back, there's really three things. Again, just peeling back bookings for you. There's three things that, we, that I would also note. One is that, yes, we did have a lot of larger bookings that help us for you know position us well for the future throughout FY22. But we had a nice mix all the way through to the smaller deals, which benefit near-term revenue. The second thing is that the bookings were very broad-based across all of our services, and that includes strategy and consulting, which is which is uh, really good as well. And lastly, you know, their line is Julie's talked quite a bit about our strategic strategic priorities: cloud, industry X, and security. For for example. Okay, thank you. Um, a follow-up here then on, on attrition. Can you just give us a sense of what you're anticipating for attrition levels factored in, into 22? And any added measures you're taking to try and drive that 19% down? Yeah, so let me just maybe um, talk a little bit about the numbers, and Julie can give some um, some other color here. But our, you know, our managed attrition 19%, Brian, was really the fourth quarter was in the zone that we expected, um, and it's 14% for the year. And we've been at 19% before. It's obviously a very hot uh, market right now. But when you peel it back, it continues to be more in the lower part of the pyramid. Um, and it's uh, largely concentrated in India, where we really uh, don't have any issues in hiring. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's important because you look at a headline number, and then you have to really kind of understand, wh you know, where is the attrition. Um, and, and, you know, at the same time, as you might imagine, we're, we're always very focused on um, making sure that we're attractive. So we're very pleased that our executive retention um, uh, is, is going very well. I think we are, you know, we very much focus on our employee value proposition. And when you think about the actions we've taken, like a record number of 120,000 promotions, uh, the training that we're providing people that's really uh, valued, 
And then, you know, frankly, things like the way that we have approached vaccines, right? So we've now vaccinated 85,000 of our people and their families directly in addition to what we're supporting, you know, through uh, like in the U.S. through our uh, our carriers. Uh, and, and, you know, as I talked a little bit about in the script, what we find is people really care about the fact that they are working for a company that focuses on financials and um, all of the other what we call 360 degree value. So, um, you know, what we're doing is sustainability, being a leader that we're going to be carbon neutral by 2025 really matters. And so we continue to look at how can we help our people be net better off, succeed personally and professionally, and be proud of a company that um, not only creates value, but leads with values. Okay, thank you. And our next question comes from the line of James Fawcett with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, wanted to ask a, a couple of, of quick questions um, that are follow up on on the hiring. Your your pace of hiring uh, and net has been you know quite stunning at least over the last couple of quarters. Can you talk about um, you know a little more detail in terms of how you're finding the hiring environment, particularly for newer skill sets? And I guess, do you think you need to kind of sustain the the, the recent pace of, of hiring going forward? Um, and you know, I guess the the my second question I'll just throw it in at the same time is is back to VNA. You, you talked about the kind of the inorganic contribution and, and integration, but um, is this kind of the recent pace that we've seen? Is is this also something that you expect to to need to sustain and want to sustain on a go forward basis? Um, whether in terms of number of deals or amount that you're spending, et cetera. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks. I will um, cover the uh, headcount. So I would just first start with, in this market, with a war for talent, we're very pleased with the 56,000 net additional people that we hired in Q4. As we see strong momentum really continuing in FY22, and you see that again in our growth rates for the first quarter. We're off to a strong start at 18 to 22 percent in Q1, and the full year at the top end at 15 percent. And um, we were able to accelerate some of our hiring, and we plan to continue to do so in quarter one, in order to have the talented people that we need to uh, match demand in the market. Um, and so, that's a, to your first question on, on hiring. To your second question on VNA, um, you know, while we I won't guide longer term into the amount of spend that we're going to do past 22 in VNA, you know, it remains an important part of our strategy, um, you know, on a go forward uh, basis. Yeah, and I just I, I think it's just to remember, um, you know, taking a step back. Uh, to, on two things. One is on the on the people side. We made a deliberate decision to accelerate hi hiring, you know, this quarter and next quarter, which, given as you said, the environment and our ability to attract people, we think makes sense. So that we're not, um, you know, we're not worried about being constrained uh, with respect to people, and you know, we're able to do that. Uh, and I think that's a, a huge differentiator for us. And secondly, you know, we made a decision last year, and we've made a decision this year in V&A to uh, really invest uh, and take advantage of our ability to invest to serve our clients. And you know, when I go to clients, one of the things that you know we talk about is, and, and clients really value, is that when they're partnering with us, they're partnering not just for the capabilities we have today, but because we have a track record of investing year in and year out and creating you know, and anticipating their needs. And we point to, you know, the kinds of acquisitions like in Umla, like in Nevada, like Infinity Works and Cloud, and that we're doing it in markets all around the world to benefit them. And so we believe this is really setting us up last year and this year, right, for those next waves of growth. Um, and, uh, and, and it's truly differentiating in the eyes of our clients. And our next Hello? question. Oh, and our next question comes from the line of Ashwin Shrivaikar from City. Please go ahead. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, Julie. Hi, Casey. Angie. Congratulations on the results and outlook. Um, first question is, you know, it, it seems clear we're in a very exciting time here for IT services, right? We've had this view for some time now that the acceleration of demand that you're seeing is sustainable for several years. And I don't mean to imply that getting revenue growth is easy, but if you have to worry less about revenue growth given the investments you've already made, do you have the opportunity to change your financial model, accelerate it, get higher gross margins, better GNA leverage, thoughts on moving to a more nonlinear model with solutions, maybe especially important given that you're at 620,000 people? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that. I think, you know, Ashwin, um, you know, our financial model, you know, really remains the same in terms of the three key imperatives that you, you hear us go through each, each year, which is grow faster than mar the market takes share, modest margin expansion while investing, um, you know, at scale in our business and our people. So in that last part, maybe I'll just talk about op margin. So we, you know, are very proud of the 10 to 30 that we have this year. Um, you know, that does imply, obviously, that we will continue to get efficiencies in how we run our business, both in terms of how we deliver to our clients, um, as well as within the SGNA and how we run our own organization. Yeah, and maybe just add a couple of points. Uh, I'm glad you acknowledge that revenue growth is not easy. Uh, so thank you for that. But uh, I, uh, I, you know, just taking a step back to just to make sure, because I think over the last decade, you've seen a real shift in the professional services industry the nature of the exponential technology change and um, the need to help clients move faster uh, and do so more efficiently has meant that you need to be able to invest significantly. So as we think about, you know, moving forward, like the investments we've done to build, you know, synops, like to, and continue to evolve it, to build industry solutions, as you mentioned, require us to continuously innovate, invest, uh, you know, you saw that in our, you know, our IP patent portfolio. And so, what I would say is, it's um, it's not that you sort of say, here's the revenue, and then can you just fundamentally shift? Because there is significant cost. You know, having all aspects of our business grow like this is not simply because there's demand. It's it's the it's the solutions we're bringing them, and. You know, as I've talked about in prior earning cloud, it isn't linear today even because we've automated so much of what we do when you look at something like our operations business, you look at, you know, my wizard and we continue to do so. And that's really part of the business now. Uh, and so I think it's important to kind of understand what's helping drive the demand for our services, our, the, you know, the, the way we're gaining market share is is um, is not simply because there's a lot of demand in the market, but the solutions we're bringing, and this is our big differentiator um, because we can go all the way from strategy to operations, right? All of the examples we're giving involve multiple aspects of our services, and you can't just build that overnight either, right? So, you know, the fact that we're becoming integrated in talent strategy and our outsourcing and our, you know, what we also call managed services is uh, is about being trusted and the fact that we could deliver during the pandemic uh, and, and be a trusted partner puts us in a very different, you know, place than, than others who might be trying to build these capabilities. Got it. Got it. Thank you for that. And, and then the other question is, you know, over the last 18 months, your revenue growth has absorbed the negative impact of less t and &E. Um, is that coming back? Do you have updated thoughts on back to office? And you know, what's what's the assumption for that in your in your outlook? So I'll let Casey answer specifically, but I will say that um, uh, if any of us can actually predict, you know, how <laughs> we're going to go to the office, like I'd like to meet that person. Uh, I, I, it is, let's just say it's been a humbling experience, right? Uh, how many times have we all gotten ready to go back? And I, I don't know about you, but like like five different things that we're going to be in person in the next two months have just come back to Zoom so um, or our Teams. Uh, so uh, uh, it's been an, an interesting time, the new normal. But Casey, why don't you take us through just to see assumptions we're using? Yeah, so um, Ashwin, just I'll first start with revenue. Our revenue guidance, the 12 to 15, it does not include any specific uptick from reimbursable travel. And if that 
assumption changes will reflect that in our updating guidance. And as Julie said, just in terms of you know, increases to travel assumed in our overall P&L for 22, uh, it is difficult to predict, but we do have uh, an increase built into, particularly in the back half of the year, for some travel costs. Got it. Thank you for that. And our next question comes from the line of Jason Kupferberg with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Thanks, guys. Uh, good morning. I wanted to start just with a visibility question. Um, the reason I ask is obviously your constant currency revenue growth here in Q4 was was quite robust. Um, so it wasn't really above the top end of your guidance, whereas in recent quarters you had been handily exceeding the top end of your expectations. So I'm just wondering, is this simply because your visibility has improved, so you've gotten more comfortable? You don't necessarily need to put extra cushion into the guidance, or or did some bookings not ramp as fast as expected in the quarter? And then just the related question for fiscal 22, as you set the initial outlook for this year, any change in approach versus this time last year? Again, perhaps because your visibility has improved. Thanks. Yeah, um, I will uh, answer both questions. You know, in, in really the same way, which is, you know, for the Fourth quarter, we were slightly above our FX adjusted guided range, but we always try to aim to be in the top quadrant, you know, top part of our guided range. And really, it's just this year, it's been a story of an unprecedented ramp. Um, so, you know, we're really pleased that we were able to kind of, you know, nail down where we thought we would uh, end out the quarter. And I'd say the same thing really for, for 22. It's not any change in, in visibility, it's not any change in the way we're doing things. Uh, we always call as we see it. These are our best estimates. Um, and uh, with the 12 to 15, you know, all parts, all, all um, points are in, in possibility. That's why they're in the range. But we continue like we always do to aim for the top quadrant and, and top part of our range. No change. Okay. Okay. Good to know. And just to follow up, um, what are your expectations for book to bill in consulting and overall um, for the first quarter and for the full fiscal year, um, and then just what you're thinking about for consulting versus outsourcing revenue growth this year. Thanks, guys. Congrats. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we feel good about our pipeline, um, you know, as we head into um, the, you know, into the fiscal year. Um, I would say, I, I will just comment on, you know, Q1 bookings. We, we do feel really good um, about where we are. You know, historically, we do see some seasonality. Uh, in Q1, and, and uh, larger deals can make things lumpy, but uh, we feel really good about our positioning for the first quarter. And in terms of revenue growth, um, I'll just say that for quarter one, we see consulting continuing in strong double digits and outsourcing in the double digits range. Okay. Great. And for the Operator, full year. we have time. Yeah, and for the full year, I mean, consulting should continue to be strong double digits, and um, you know, outsourcing, depending on where we land in the range, will be high single to low double digits. Thank you. Great. Uh -huh. Great. Thanks. Operator, we have time for one more question, and then, and then Julie will wrap up the call. Of course. And that last question comes from the line of Tin Jin Huang with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, really impressive growth at scale here. I, I wanted to ask on Industry X, it was $5 billion in revenue, so we said up 36% I wrote down. So. I think Julie said it's the next frontier here. Does this have potential to be as big as cloud? I'm just trying to think about the sizing of Industry X, recognizing it's early, but also its importance. Yeah, I mean, I think we're not really sizing that today. I mean, when you think about cloud, cloud is the entire enterprise, so right. uh, sort of hard to sort of do that. What we'd say is this will be, I mean, we're already at $5 billion and we consider it the next digital frontier, and it's super early, right? Some technologies have just, you know, really been coming online in the last year or two that are cloud-based. And um, and when you look at, like, what we're doing, for example, like Vivian uh, Westwood, one of the largest independent global, you know, fashion companies, we're doing a new PLM solution for them. We're doing so for Al um, Alstrom, a, also a global leader in transportation. Uh, we're used, doing the same, uh, you know, in a power company. So they could be the, the range of what we're doing I mean, is, is both broad-based in terms of industry, and so um, we do think of this uh, as really um, a big growth driver uh, for the future, um, but not sizing it today. 
Okay. No, no worries. Just, just thought it was interesting because the scope of it can be quite large. Um, just my, my quick follow-up to on. I know you had you field a lot of questions on acquisitions already. Digital assets are are being quite uh, valued pretty highly here uh, across the board. Uh, looks like you're still implying a, a reasonable revenue multiple um, with your inorganic contribution. Has have you seen any changes on the valuation side? I know you're still a a destination for many companies, but just just curious if valuations have changed in, in any way in your thinking. Okay, Steve, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, I say, Tinjin, uh, you know, clearly, you know, valuations, you know, we're, we participate in the overall market. And you've seen what valuations have done in the overall market, but I would just say that, you know, we have pretty high hurdle rates in terms of what we expect from our business cases. Um, and we track that very closely, as you would uh, expect of us, and we're very pleased with our ongoing performance of our portfolio against the hurdle rates that we put forth in those business cases. Yeah, no, it's impressive. Thank you both. Great, thank you. All right, well, now time to wrap up. Uh, in closing, I want to thank uh, all of our people and our managing directors for what you all do every day. Our you know, people and actions and results in FY21 have really put us in a terrific position as we go into FY22 to create even more value uh, ahead. And uh, I know I and the entire leadership team are super excited and confident about what's to come. And uh, I'll simply end by thanking all of our shareholders for your continued trust and support. Be well, everyone. Thanks. And ladies and gentlemen, today's conference will be available for replay after 10 a.m. Eastern today through December 16th. You may access AT&T Replay System at any time by dialing 1-866-207-1041, entering the access code 670-4907. International participants may dial 402-970-0847, and those numbers again are 1-866-207-1041, and 402-970-0847, again, entering the access code 670-4907. That does conclude your conference for today. Thank you for your participation and for using AT&T Conference Service. You may now disconnect.